Okay, in the previous video, we talked about what analysis really was and what the, the whole technique of it was. And we saw that it's very important to have a notion of what it means for a sequence of points to converge. Those points are usually approximations in some sense. So if we're going to continue on in complex analysis, we're going to have to address the question, what does it mean for complex sequences or sequences of complex numbers to converge to some other complex number? So first of all, what is a sequence? A sequence is just kind of an infinite list indexed by the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on to infinity. Or some people can ignore 0. It doesn't really matter. So it's just going to be a list of complex numbers. Z sub 0, or Z sub 1, Z sub 2, Z sub 3, and so on. And, and you, you know, there can be repeats. It doesn't matter if Z1 is the same as Z3 or something. It's just an infinite list. So, you know, what might it look like? Maybe there's your z sub 0, there's your z sub 1, there's your z sub 2. Maybe z sub 3 comes over here. There's no pattern necessarily. And then z sub 4 continues, z sub 5, z sub 6, z sub 7 is all the way over here, z sub 8, 9. And then let's say they just keep getting closer and closer and closer to this red point over here. And let's call that red point w. So intuitively, I mean, that's what you would expect it to mean that this sequence converges to W. Sure, there are some outliers that just kind of get thrown around, but then eventually they all just kind of concentrate around W. And so intuitively what it means for the sequence of complex numbers to converge to W is that they get closer and closer to this point W. And this video is going to be about uh, making rigorous the term closer and closer, that phrase. We're going to make it rigorous. So what does closer and closer mean? Well, there are three definitions of convergence that I'll give you. The first definition is the distance definition, or also known as the epsilon n definition. So notation-wise, z1 through zn, so I guess I'm not starting at z0 here, z1 through zn is the sequence. It doesn't really matter if you did start at z0, but that's how I wrote it. And w is the point that it's going to converge to. We say that w... Uh, sorry, we say that the sequence converges to W if the following definition is satisfied. So here's the big definition. It has lots of symbols, so we're going to pick it apart and try and parse it. For every, so remember this kind of notation. That's for every. That's the Greek letter epsilon greater than zero. So that means any, any epsilon greater than zero you give me. So you get to pick an epsilon greater than zero. There exists... That's the symbol for there exists. Some capital N that is an element, so in or is an element, and this is the set of integers. So there's a, a positive integer, I didn't say positive, but such that little n greater than capital N implies that the modulus or the, the length of the complex number z sub n minus w is less than epsilon. So that's a horribly complicated definition, but let's parse it and, and try and figure out exactly what it means. First of all, why would we be interested in this object, the, the length or the modulus of z sub n minus w? What's the significance of this quantity? Well, if you draw z sub n as I have in blue, and I'm drawing it kind of as a vector, and you draw w in red, then z sub n minus w is this green vector that emanates from the, the tip of w and goes to zn. In other words, if we're thinking of these purely as points, zn is really just this point at the tip, and w is really just this point uh, at the tip of the red vector. And so the length of the green vector is precisely the distance between those two points. So z sub n minus w if we take its its length, it's the length. Uh, uh, sorry, its length is the distance between z n and w. So that's what this term is. This is just the distance between z n and w. You might even write it like that. And so we're asking for that to be less than epsilon. So here's what the sequence might look like. There's your z one, z two, and so on. So this length from this red point to this black point over here is z sub two minus w. Take the length. And this length here from the red point to this z sub 4 over there is the modulus of z sub 4 minus w. 
So that's what this is. That, that should hopefully demystify that notation. But what about all of this other jibber-jabber? All right, so I think the best way to explain what this definition is trying to communicate is to have a dialogue. So I've written this nice dialogue here between me and you, the viewer. Me. The sequence z sub n converges to the point w. You. How do you know? Well, the, the points get closer and closer to w. Hmm. Are they closer than one centimeter to w? Yup, all of them actually are. Okay, are they closer than 0.1 centimeter? Well, most of them are. But not all? <laughs> no, but only the first few are further than 0.1 centimeter away from w. Aside from those few, all the rest are within 0.1 centimeter of w. All right, so maybe one centimeter, so this is going to be big, maybe one centimeter is that big. All of them are within it. But maybe 0.1 centimeter is going to be only that big, and I should have centered it at w, of course. Maybe uh, 0.1 centimeter is only that big. The first six or so points may not be within a distance of 0.1 centimeter from w, but the rest of them are everything after the sixth point, the seventh, and so on. Okay, so most of them are within there. Okay, so you start picking smaller and smaller numbers. You try one centimeter, 0.1 centimeter, so then you say, okay, are they closer than 0 0.01 centimeter? Me, again, you have to ignore those first few, the original first seven or six or something, and a few more. Maybe you have to, 0 0.01 centimeters is a lot smaller. Maybe 0 0.01 centimeters is like just this region right there. So you have to ignore more and more of them. But eventually, you'll get to a point in the sequence z sub n where every later element of the sequence, little z sub little n, that is to say, so after a certain point here, for point 0.1 centimeter, we said that, look, z sub 6 is that point right there, it's outside of your, it's, it's outside of 0.1 centimeters, it's, it's more than 0.1 centimeters away from w. But, 6 is what we call our capital N. If we pick any little n, cap, greater than our capital N, which is 6, so, you know, 7 or 8 or anything comes later on, you know, a million to the millionth power or something like that, you know, whatever you want, any number bigger than 6, basically that point in the sequence will be within 0.1 centimeters of it. So there's a sort of point of no return here, and that's where this dialogue comes from. So again, there's this point in the sequence z sub n, this point of no return, where every later element of the sequence, z sub little n for little n cap greater than capital N, is within 0 0.01 centimeters of w. And you say, all right, I'll trust you that you can find such a point of no return, for 0 0.01 centimeters, but what about 0 0.001 centimeters? Well, I'll have to pick a different value of capital N, probably a much bigger one. I'll have to wait till much later on in the sequence, to, you know, much further on in the sequence. But eventually, I can still find a capital N where every later element of the sequence is within 0 0.001 centimeter of W. You, but what about, look, look. Give me any epsilon, no matter how small. So that's what epsilon is supposed to be in that original definition. It's supposed to be some really small positive number. Some really small number. It's the error. I guess that's why they use the letter epsilon. It's the Greek letter for E. It's the error of the approximation, where I guess we're thinking of the z sub n's, that sequence of points, as approximations to the point w. It's the error. It's supposed to be, how far off are we? And basically, if I'm going to say that the sequence converges to it, then we shouldn't be very far off. There should be points at later on in the sequence. Again, you might have to throw out the first several. You might have to throw out the first six, or the first hundred, or the first million kajillion of them. But you have an infinite sequence here. So eventually, you want them to be within epsilon, no matter how small you make epsilon. 
you should be able to get more and you know closer and closer to W, and that's the point. All right, so no matter how small your epsilon is, you get to pick the epsilon. You get to tell me, you know, I'm willing to tolerate this much error in the approximation, but no more. That's fine. You get to make that choice, and then it's my job to go and find for you a point of no return. I can always find some value of capital N so that for any little n greater than capital N, for any point further along in the sequence than that capital N, than the capital nth point, you know, the z sub n plus first point, the z sub n plus second point, and all the rest of them from then on, the distance between w, the point we're trying to approximate by our sequence, and the points z sub n, everything that comes after that capital nth point, will be less than your epsilon. That is the distance between them, which we already said was the modulus of the of the difference, the length of the difference between those two numbers, will be less than the epsilon you chose. All right, so that's the point. It's I I can always find some point of no return in the sequence where if you ignore everything that came before it and you're only focusing on those infinite number of elements that come after that point of no return, all of them are within a distance less than epsilon no matter how small you make epsilon. And you might be a smart ass and you might say, well, what if epsilon is zero? Are your points within zero distance of W? And I can't reply to that, that's silence. So the problem, of course, is, you know, to be less than epsilon when epsilon is zero would mean that you're a negative number. You can't have negative distance. Or even if you ask me to have zero distance, well, even as I've drawn it originally with this black set of points, you know, they're allowed to equal. In general, if you have a sequence that gets closer and closer to a point and then just eventually just keeps equaling that point again and again and again and again and again, then yeah, we say that that sequence converges to that point. Technically, that will satisfy this definition that I've boxed here. But even if the sequence you know, never actually reaches that point, like this original sequence I drew here, but they just get closer and closer to it, you know, but never quite reach it, then we still say that they converge to this point. But the distance isn't zero. The distance is just getting really, really, really small. So no matter how small you ask the distance to be, I can still find infinite number of points in the sequence. In fact, all of the points past a certain point of no return will all lie within that distance. You pick something even smaller, I'll probably have to go further along in the sequence to find a point of no return, but I can still find it, as long as you don't give me something silly like zero. You gotta give me at least a little bit of leeway. All right, so that's the first definition, the epsilon n definition. And it's a nice exercise in making sure you understand what all these symbols mean to think carefully about what this sentence is saying. For every epsilon greater than zero that you give me, there exists a capital N, which is an integer that I have to come up with, such that for any, any uh, that such that if little n is greater than that capital N, then that means that z sub little n is within an epsilon distance of W. That's really what this definition is saying. All right, so that's one definition. Here's another definition. So that's the epsilon N or the, the distance definition. Now let's discuss the open disk definition. Now this is the same as the distance definition, but it's phrased in a more geometric way. Uh, basically, we're just paying closer attention to what exactly it means to be within a distance less than epsilon of w. So z sub n is within epsilon of w. It's within a distance epsilon of w. If and only if, as we saw before, the length of the modulus of z sub n minus w is less than epsilon. Remember, that was this picture over here. All right, it's the distance between those two points. If and only if, and here's the real point, z sub n is inside the open disk of radius epsilon centered at w, and we call that d sub epsilon with do, you know, of w in that way. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I've, I have some pictures here drawn. So there's our original point w there in the center of these circles. Let's talk about the biggest circle first. Let's say that that radius of that biggest circle is epsilon. It's the small epsilon that you were worried about before, that you, you picked, that you were willing to allow a certain approximation. So d sub epsilon of w 
means that you're looking at an open disk. So you're looking at a disk centered at W, radius of epsilon. So I've already drawn it in this blue disk for you. And we're looking at the interior of it. Okay, so we're looking at just the interior of that disk. In fact, we have to exclude the boundary circle. So the, the reason is that if z sub n is on the boundary circle, well, what does that mean? If it's on the boundary circle of a, of a uh, circle of radius epsilon at w, then that means that its distance to w is actually equal to epsilon. But we're not interested in this being equal to epsilon. We're interested in this being less than epsilon. The distance should be less than epsilon. means that you're within an, an open epsilon disk of w. Within it. Not on the boundary, but within it. So the way you might see this drawn in a book, but I, one note does not permit me to draw dotted circles as far as I know, you would see it drawn more like this. They would make a dashed line for the boundary, and then you'd still have centered at w, and you'd still have a radius of epsilon. The dashed line on the boundary means you're supposed to ignore the boundary and only look at what's going on inside of it. So I would have drawn that if one note would have permitted me. And then, of course, I mean, for any different choice of epsilon, for you know, if you play this game where you're picking smaller and smaller and smaller epsilons, then you're going to get smaller and smaller disks centered at w. All right. So basically, what we want is for the sequence to eventually get within that disk, and in fact, any smaller disk. So the point is that instead of saying I want the distance to get smaller and smaller. I want there to be a point of no return for the distances. Well, you could just say, I want those points to eventually get inside of an open disk centered at W. And no matter how small I make that open disk, eventually there should be some point of no return where it gets within that disk. So even if you pick a very tiny epsilon, if you look at the open disk of radius epsilon, then eventually you'll want every point of my sequence past some point of no return to be within that disk. And you should have complete freedom. You should be able to pick smaller and smaller disks. I might have to pick a, a later and later point of no return, but I should always be able to find one. OK, so with all of this, I can give you the definition. We say that z sub n converges to w if, for each open disk centered at w, no matter how small, so i.e., for each d sub epsilon of w for any, sorry, not for any w, for any epsilon. Made a mistake there. For any epsilon, no matter how small, okay, as long as it's greater than zero. So for any epsilon greater than zero. Of course, you can't tell me epsilon has to equal zero. I can't get to the point necessarily. But as long as I can get within epsilon of it, which is what this all you know means to be within an open disk centered at that, again, there exists some capital N point of no return such that N greater than that point of no return implies that z sub n is inside of that open disk. And remember, being inside of that open disk means, that obviously, I mean, if you're inside the open disk, your distance to w has to be less than epsilon. The radius of the disk is epsilon. Everything outside of it is, is a distance greater than epsilon. Everything inside of it is a distance less than epsilon. So that's just another more geometric way of phrasing it that uses open disks. So I like this. It's, it's just kind of the geometry behind this more algebraic definition. And then finally, I want to give you one more definition, the spirit of which is, is going to be hard to communicate to you guys. It's the open neighborhood definition. And the real reason this is an important definition, I mean, there are a number of reasons, but it's, it's more malleable. And in particular, in the next video, it'll allow us to talk about things like open sets and closed sets. And it's very convenient to phrase a lot of theorems in terms of these objects. So for now, just kind of take it as an interesting, an interesting little side note that we can define it in a third way, the open neighborhood definition. And the idea of the open neighborhood definition is to focus on the geometry, the kind of open disk definition, but ask the, the obvious question, do they have to be open disks? Does that have to be their geometry? So suppose that, you know, it looked like this. Suppose I had a sequence of points that approached w like this. So up here in this in this disk definition, you got to pick a disk. No, no matter how small the disk was centered at w, I had to find a point of no return where every point of the sequence after that point of no return would lie inside of that disk, forcing them to be really close to w. 
And even if you picked a smaller disk, I'd have to find a later point of no return, but I'd always have to be able to find a point of no return. Okay, well, what if instead of picking disks, you picked weird little shapes like this? A rectangle, or this weird little shape, or this weird little kind of bobble, you know, blobby shape or something, or this little kind of heart shape or something. You know, do, do, do they have to be disks? Just, sorry about that. Okay, I hope this is still recording the screen. Screwed up a little there. But the point is that you should be able to pick any open set, and no matter kind of how small or how irregular that open set is, and I'll, I'll address what that term means in a moment, but as long as it kind of contains W, I should, you know, my, it should still contain points of my sequence. Of course, it can't be any open set. I mean, if there's my point W, and the, the set was just a curve or something, and my sequence never even touches that curve, then we're in a bad situation. So we have to avoid this kind of picture. So it has to be this kind of, these things that have interiors almost, that contain some sort of girth around W, some air around W so that W can breathe. So that's the definition of an open neighborhood. An open neighborhood of a point W is a set containing W which obeys the following condition. And I'll draw a picture for you. If x is any point in the set, so it could be w or it could be any other point, then there is some open disk. In particular, this applies to, to w, right? But there, there is some open disk around x, around that point, which is also contained in the set. So here's a, a, a point w, and here's this open neighborhood of w, and here's a point x in, the, in this open neighborhood. I should be able to find some small enough disk centered at x that is completely contained within this neighborhood, within this set. Okay, I might have to make a really, really, really small disk. If I pick something really close to the boundary, I can still fit a disk in there, but it has to be a really tiny disk. And the closer I get to the boundary, the tinier the disk has to be. But I can always find some open disk around it, some yeah, some open disk around any point in this entire set. So notice that we cannot include the points on the boundary. Because if, if I picked this point on the boundary here, and I said that was an element of my set, any open disk I draw around this, this boundary point, this black point here, is going to contain, sure, some points of my set, but it's also going to contain some points that are not in my set. Some points that, uh, you know, that, that, that are not in my set. So, so it's, it's not going to be contained in my set. It's going to contain points that aren't in my set, so it's not a subset of my set. So, so that's the kind of problem. You have to exclude boundary points. So that's why we use these dashed lines all these places. You don't want to include boundary points because they'll have any open disk around them will contain some points of your set, but also points that aren't in your set. So that's just part of the definition. So note that, by the way, if d sub epsilon of x, so so maybe that's this d sub epsilon of x right there, it's a disk of radius epsilon around x, is contained in the set, then so is d sub epsilon prime of x for any epsilon prime less than epsilon, right? If I pick a smaller open disk centered at x, of course that's contained in the bigger open disk. So if the bigger open disk is in my set, well then of course every smaller open disk is in my set too. That's just a side note. But this is the definition. An, a set is an open neighborhood of W if you can pick any point in that set and you can find some, potentially very small, open disk centered at that point contained completely in your set. So in particular, this little curve I've drawn up here does not work. Because if you, you know, pick any point, it contains some points, but it also contains all these points that are not on the curve. So curves don't really work. Notice two things that relate the open neighborhood definition to the open disk definition. Every open neighborhood of W contains an open disk centered at W. Well, sure, W is a point in it, so by definition, it has to contain some open disk, and therefore every smaller open disk, right? But also, notice that every open disk centered at W is an open neighborhood of W. In particular, Open disks satisfy this property. If you pick, there's W, if you pick any point in the open disk, 
you can always find some smaller open disk centered at that point that is contained in your open disk. So that kind of shows us the relationship. So with that in mind, with that in mind, let's, um, here's the definition of what it means for sequence z sub n to converge to w. For every open neighborhood of w, so you get to pick an open neighborhood, again, potentially a very kind of small one, and it doesn't matter what shape it is, I can still find a capital n, a point of no return, such that little n greater than capital n implies z sub little n is inside of it. So is inside of your open neighborhood. All right, so I can find some point of no return such that every element of my sequence is eventually inside of every open set. And because, you know, open disks are in particular open sets, if you've satisfied definition two, then you can always fix, you know, fit some open disk inside around W and so on. You can you can easily see, therefore, that, the, I mean, I'll leave it as an exercise, but uh, you can easily see that definitions two and three are equivalent to one another. And I've already hinted at why definitions one and two are equivalent to one another.